Steve Preston, welcome to Partnering Leadership. I'm thrilled to have you in this conversation with me. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Steve, you have had a magnificent background in business, then in public service, and now leading Goodwill. But before we get to that, would love to know whereabouts you grew up and how your upbringing impacted the kind of person and leader you've become. Yeah. Well, uh, I grew up in a working class town in Wisconsin. Uh, you know, I had great parents. Uh, they came from very difficult circumstances, though. Uh, and they worked incredibly hard uh, for us. We had five children. They worked very hard so that we could have a better life than they had. Uh, and they always wanted what was best for us. And it was their expectation that they would do whatever they could to give us that good life. Um, you know, my father grew up in a coal mining camp in Appalachia. Uh, he was the ninth of 11 kids. He was born and uh, lived in a little kind of like a four room shack with a coal stove in the middle, no plumbing, no electricity, no heat. Uh, they were very poor, sort of, I describe it at times as no shoes poor. Uh, and he quit school in ninth grade, and he went to work in the foundries in Dayton as a teenager. Uh, uh, and my mother uh, grew up in Germany in World War II. She was born in 1930. She was a little girl when the Nazis came to power. She grew up with air raids and running to bomb shelters, uh, very hungry after the war. She saw, you know, many terrible things. Um, and so, you know, that was sort of our context growing up. We knew that they had had very difficult lives. And even though our world was pretty tight financially, um, we always knew we had more than they had and that they were doing everything they could for us. Um, you know, they were also very hard workers. Uh, and I said, they're completely com committed to the kids. They never complained about anything. Uh, and, uh, and as a result, I think I seldom looked to people of power or success or wealth uh, as being my models in life, unless they represent something more. Um, because I, I do think that those things are kind of counterfeit gods. Uh, and I look much more as a result to people who've overcome uh, and who've found sort of a, a wholeness in their lives through purpose uh, and meaning. Um, the other thing I would say about growing up the way I did, specifically with my parents, is, you know, in a time of increasing awareness about inequities in our society, um, I've so many times been reminded of the lessons of my parents. Uh, we, or I grew up in Wisconsin uh, in sort of a, you know, uh, you know, Midwestern, all white working class town. And we moved to Florida when I was seven or eight years old uh, into a racially mixed, extremely seg segregated, area with many people who are vocal racists. And we had just never encountered anything like that before. And so as an eight-year-old, I saw my parents' reaction to that. Uh, they both had a bit of a temper <laughs> and I can recall <laughs> their anger uh, when they confronted that. And I remember my father just being very agitated when he heard somebody saying the N-word and telling us children, um, that word is not about color, it is about hatred, and we need to understand that. Uh, and, he, and throughout his work and other life, he had really been in very integrated settings and he loved people just for who they were. Uh, and that was just so deeply offensive to him. Uh, and another time, I remember going to the doctor to get stitches uh, in Florida, I had two older brothers, so getting stitches was not that unusual. <laughs> and we walked into the waiting room uh, at the doctor's office. My mother went to the counter to register. And the receptionist asked my mother to go out the door and go into the other waiting room. And we realized that we were in the waiting room for African-Americans, and we were asked to go in the waiting room for white people. And she was so angry. Uh, that a group of people would be treated differently and have to wait longer because of their skin color. And um, I can still almost hear her talking about it. And um, what I realized was growing up in Germany the way she did, she'd seen um, her friends in grade school flee the country because she had a couple of Jewish girlfriends. And probably the most horrific story, uh, as an eight-year-old, she was marched out of her school one day for a special event. Well, that event was to watch the synagogue in town be incinerated and burnt to the ground. Uh, and many years later, uh, when I started studying European history, I realized that it was Kristallnacht 
which was oh, wow. really an enormous turning point uh, in the oppression of Jews in Germany. And she retold that story through the eyes of an eight-year-old. And so I think she had very deeply ingrained, uh, a very deeply ingrained sense of, of fairness and, and, uh, and it, you know, it carries through to me this day. What powerful experiences, Steve, and powerful values that your father and your mother gave you. One of the things I talk about with respect to leadership is that leadership is example more than the words that people say. And your parents, through their example, showed what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, giving you those values from early on in your life, which is really inspiring to hear. Now, with those values and their belief in education, uh, what was it that, that got you to study political science at Northwestern? <laughs> I would imagine they would want you to study something practical. <laughs> you know, it's, it's who knows uh, why we, um, we become who we are. I have to tell you, this is the, you know, you'll realize I was a strange kid. I can remember watching election returns when I was eight years old and how fascinated I was by the political process and the election process. And as I got into high school, I, you know, I had um, a subscription to one of the periodicals that covered, you know, politics. And so I was always interested in political science. So the irony was I didn't go into the political realm. I actually went and got an MBA and went into business. But many, many years later, it sort of all came back to that. And, um, <laughs> you know, I was in my mid 40s by the time I actually went into my government service. And it, it really did feel like it came full circle as a result. Yeah, and so you you did study political science, get your MBA, and had a significant experience in investment banking and corporate finance. Now, why, besides your love for politics, did you give up business for the opportunity to serve in government? Well, yeah, that was a completely different uh, decision set. Um, I loved business. I loved uh, the you know, the challenges. Uh, I love the leadership process. I love being part of a team and, and, and growing an operation. Um, but I, I, I got to a point where I just felt this deep need to have a different kind of impact with my life. Uh, not that I don't think that business is a, is a, is, is a, is a worthy calling. I think, I, I think our world needs uh, terrific business leaders and principled business leaders and, and, you know, business is the largest employer and I think it affects people's lives profoundly. But I wanted, I, want, I felt a deep need for a more direct connection. And um, it probably wasn't the most opportune time. I had five small children. Uh, things were going really, really well in the corporate world. Um, but I've noticed in life when I have a strong conviction about something, um, everything else sort of seems to pale. And so um, I had an opportunity um, and I hadn't been a political person. I got a call from somebody who was serving the administration who'd worked with me in business and said, would you ever think about doing this? So I had a, an opportunity to lead the Small Business Administration. And the Small Business Administration, in addition to many of the things it does for small business, makes loans to homeowners who've lost their home in a, in a, in a natural disaster and don't have insurance to rebuild their homes or to repair them. And I came in about 10 months after uh, Hurricane Katrina, and there were 160,000 people in the queue to get a loan who were not getting service because of a of an operational collapse effectively in the, in the loan making process. And these were people who didn't have the means, um, couldn't get moved back to their communities. Their communities couldn't get rebuilt to begin with. And the interesting thing about that opportunity was I had people strongly advising me not to do it. I talked to a, a recruiter that I respected very highly. He said, you are perfectly perched in your career right now. Do not ruin it. And, you know, it was very public. There was terrible press uh, all the time about the SBA at the time. And I just said to myself, you know, I could stay on this track uh, and, um, but where does that lead? Sure, I could get a bigger job. Sure, I could make more money. Sure, I could, you know, uh, get more visibility or prestige or whatever. 
But I started to say, if 30 or 40 years from now, I'm looking back on my life, even if I fail, won't I want to have been the person who said, I'll serve? <clears throat> and so it was, it was just this kind of, you know, I don't know, one of those moments in life where you just say, who, like, who am I? And what am I going to do? And why am I going to do it? And what do I stand for? So I sort of <laughs> threw caution to the wind, um, moved my family, uh, took the role. Um, it was, you know, I had 50, 20 congressional hearings in 15 months, uh, first 15 months of the job. It was just an enormous operational um, challenge. I, and I have never made a better career decision in my life. Um, I, I sort of felt like in that space because the, um, the need was so great. Um, and I went down to New Orleans and I met people who needed those loans and I listened to their stories and I saw uh, those neighborhoods and, and sort of you realize that, you know, when, when that is placed in front of you, you know that every day you've got to be on your game, right? And so it was a wonderful opportunity for me just to take um, years of business experience, operational uh, experience, finance experience, leadership experience, and do everything I could to pull together a team, uh, invest myself fully uh, in a different path forward for those people. And um, the other thing I didn't mention is the SBA at the time had the lowest employee morale of the 31 large agencies in the federal government. So I knew that the employee base was also just terribly dejected. And um, so with a, a great team, and great support. We turned that loan process around very quickly. Within uh, six weeks of, of rolling out a new process, we doubled production. Within a few months, we had cleared out the entire backlog. By the end of the year, we had $6 billion into people's hands. And the SBA received the most improved award uh, for best places to work uh, in the next uh, government survey. So it was just... Um, it was one of those things where I looked back and said, you know, everybody said I shouldn't do this, but I don't, I don't know that I've ever been more gratified um, to have done something uh, that involved risk. And I, I'll never forget um, reading a survey once of octogenarians where um, the question was asked, what do you regret in life? And I remember two of the things on that list. One was, I wish I had taken more risks. And the other one was, I wish I'd invested more in relationships. And uh, my wife told me once, I think we've got the risk thing covered because <laughs> <laughs> I've had a couple of jumping off points where I've made sort of atypical decisions because of sort of what my heart was telling me. And, and they've always worked out well. Now, you, your uh, uh, wife and you must have had, uh, you know, self-talk going in the uh, back of your minds because as you were just the day you were unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate, uh, that's when uh, CBS Evening News uh, criticized the way the agency was operating. So there, there is a lot that uh, was happening at SBA, and it didn't stop even the day that uh, uh, you were uh, confirmed. But the question I have, uh, Steve, having spent most of uh, my life in DC area, a lot of uh, our uh, listeners are people that uh, uh, have worked or work for federal agencies. It is incredible what uh, you were able to do as a leader of the U.S. Small Business Administration, both in terms of the service to the businesses that needed you, but also in terms of the engagements and the satisfaction of the employees working there. How were you able to transform uh, the uh, U.S. Small Business Administration from what was an extreme low point to moving it up both in terms of service and in terms of the satisfaction of the uh, federal workforce there? Yeah, so um, I think when a lot of people come into these, these roles, it's very easy to kind of step into a very elevated position because, you know, because they're high visibility. Um, people are calling you by your title all the time. <laughs> 
uh, you know, people will refer to you in the third person when they're sitting next to you, which is kind of really <laughs> crazy. And um, when I came into the agency, I was advised, I wanted to do a video. I wanted to, I wanted people to see who I was. I wanted them to hear my voice and I wanted them to know that I was there to be, you know, uh, to be with them. So I did a few things. Number one, I, um, they said, you know, my, my team said, oh, like quick, happy talk, just give them a, you know, three minute video and just upbeat and happy. And I said, <laughs> we got the lowest morale in the government. I said, happy. And so I said, I spoke to them from the heart and I said, I, I like, I've read the employee surveys. I, I really want to be your partner in moving this forward. And I, I like, and I'm going to commit to you. Uh, my first day in the job, I had a big uh, reception down in the like the main room at the SBA, and I served uh, uh, coffee. I was behind the coffee urn, and I said, "If anybody wants coffee, <laughs> you got to come to me, because I'm going to meet everybody in this room." And I had another one of my one of my colleagues kind of uh, handing out bagels. Uh, and then the other thing we did um, was uh, when I got sworn in, uh, I reached out to the White House and I said, "You know, I'm not going to ask for many." favors, but I would like the president <laughs> to come to the SBA and clear me in. And they said, well, that might be a little bit too much, but why don't we send a vice president? Well, that had never happened before. No, no, the vice president had never been in that building before. And the buzz was incredible. People, and we didn't have enough room for everybody and people were, you know, getting raffles for it and, you know, everything else. And I talked to his people and I said, I need you, I need the vice president in his speech to talk about the importance of this agency because people are dejected and we need a different path forward. And then as we be began to do the hard work of fixing the problems, it was all it was all done with employees in the room, with asking them their best ideas, figuring it, listening hard to where the issues were, and validating those ideas. You know, I always say ninety percent of the best ideas are in the building. Um, people know, and and who knows the people who are picking up the phone, talking to your customers, the people that are processing the paperwork. They're the ones that see where everything is broken, and they're the ones that touch the people who are in difficulty. So we opened up communication mechanisms to hear from people throughout the organization. And we actively engage them in the process of redesigning the path forward. And then going forward, we updated them every step of the way. I was always in front of employees saying, here's, here's what we've created. Here's what we heard. Here's where we're going. Here's the results. And we're doing it because you've been part of the process and you've given us your best. And it was terrific. And I just, I just love those people. And the other thing I didn't do is I didn't put political appointees over everything. I pulled uh, from the career ranks. And there were many projects where I had career employees over political employees, which made a lot of political people unhappy. But I said, like, I, I want people who are really good at these issues and who know where to go and how to lead, to lead these initiatives. And we're all on the same team. And so um, it's sort of, it's sort of, I think, introduce a different kind of engagement, a different kind of ethos at the agency. And we, we just had, we just had a lot of fun doing it. So you led that transformation, but there's something that uh, uh, you seek out challenges because then <laughs> you became 14th secretary of U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development in 2008. I know, I know. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> it's funny. I I, I uh, interviewed with the president for that job, and um, which is uh, you know sort of a uh, you know a disquieting <laughs> a disquieting uh, process. Uh, he was great. He was great. But um, we were sitting down in the Oval Office uh, talking. He was interviewing me. He said you know, why do you want this job? <laughs> and I said, well, sir, you know, people said I was crazy when I accepted the SBA job. He said, you were. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, you know, this is why we're here. Like, this is why we come to serve. I mean, what, what, what more could you ask than to be in a major crisis that affects hundreds of thousands or even millions of people when like you've been blessed with, certain gifts or certain training or certain experiences that are directly applicable to this situation. I mean, like it doesn't get any better than that. 
And when I came to HUD, I was not a traditional HUD secretary. I did not have a background in poverty housing or housing policy, but the, t- the, 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 the issue of the day was mortgages and defaults and people getting kicked out of their homes and the financial markets falling apart. Well, I'd been an investment banker. I was a CFO. Um, I knew how financial markets worked. Uh, I knew the banking system um, and, and, um, and I knew operations. And, and, and so the other thing that was happening was because the subprime loans had gone away, everybody was coming to, S, to uh, HUD for FHA loans. So our volume went up, I don't know, eight, nine, 10 times. And I just thought, you know what? It doesn't get any better than to be able to use your gifts in a place that matters. Um, and, um, and I just feel so blessed that I got to do that. And, and I also, once again, I just served with terrific people who I just tried to sponsor them. You know, people would come in and say, we've got an idea. I'll never forget. Uh, it was either Hurricane Ike or Gustav, um, people in the Gulf, uh, specifically South, South Texas had, had tens of thousands had lost their homes and they were in hotels and FEMA came to us and said, we don't know what, what to do with people. And um, a couple of my, my people, both career people came and said, we think we can figure out how to house these people in apartments. And I was terrified. I just said, how in the world are you going to do that? They, they laid out the scheme and they, are you sure? Can we really do this? I'm going to sponsor you. We're going to get this done. And it was successful. And, and it was because we opened up the opportunity for people to come forward with these great ideas. I mean, these people were career civil servants and for them to be able to have an idea that moved the needle that significantly in a crisis or in another situation was just thrilling for them. And I was, you know, uh, I was, you know, I, 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 you know, just wanted to sponsor them and I hope that you know, I wanted them to succeed uh, obviously. But uh, um, when I, I said, you know what, we just got to go for this. We just got to do it. And that happened time and again. It happened time and again because we opened up paths for people to come forward with their great ideas and, and do something with them. And I got to take the credit for it, unfortunately. You know? But uh, I, I shouldn't say it that way. They were just, you know, just great people, great people. You have that purpose drive, Steve, that uh, repeatedly shows throughout your career. You seek out those challenges to make a difference. And then uncap the potential of the people that know best, that are the people that want to contribute, but sometimes leadership doesn't provide them the opportunities and channel their energies to contribute. So that's why you also uh, did a great job there. Going back to the private sector, but it sounds like you know you have this itching for even greater purpose. You did great things in the private sector, 2019, you ended up accepting to become president and CEO of Goodwill. Why now, after having worked in private sector, having contributed uh, in governments, different couple of different agencies, were you willing to come back and now lead a nonprofit organization? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that I had made the decision to go into government because I went through a a period where I just felt like I wanted to have a different kind of impact. And after government, I went to the private sector. I ran a couple of companies and I really had that strong sense again. Um, and But my sense on what I wanted to do was much more specific. Uh, I actually, uh, through, I think, a period of discernment, um, put, wrote a personal mission statement. And that personal mission statement was to lead and grow a company whose mission it was to help difficult to employ people flourish and grow and find economic livelihood, transforming their lives and helping to improve communities. So I I crafted that statement. And my idea was I was gonna work with people to, you know, maybe get a group of people together and buy a company or go to a private equity firm. And, And our mandate would in part be to hire people with challenges and give them a place where they could where they could flourish and they could, um, you know, grow professionally and get the support they needed. And um, I, I, I had begun to look at that possibility, and I got this um, call from Goodwill, uh, and I didn't even know what Goodwill did. 
And Goodwill is the largest provider of, of job support services and workforce development in the country. We all know Goodwill for the stores because that's sort of our direct experience. But in addition to those 3,300 stores, there are 800 locations where we do different types of job support. And so I just it just felt providential when I got the phone call. And you know, I, I think it so much of this goes back, I think, to where I came from and the experiences I've had in life. You know, I, I you know, my uh, you know, I know so many people in my family would have had very different lives if they'd had access to education. Um, and um, and I know for me, growing up where I did. Honestly, I, you know, I got a postcard from Northwestern University. I didn't even know what it was. My guidance counselor didn't know what it was. I was 100 miles from the school. I went to visit and it was like, this is really different than anything I've ever experienced. And when I went to that school, they, they brought me in, they made it possible for me financially and the Red Sea parted in my life. I, I had a fundamentally different path forward because I was given access to a place that was very different from where I came from and afforded me opportunities and development and, and pathways that I just didn't know existed. And, I, and, and too many people in our country are outside of what I call the circle of access, right? They're on the outside looking in at other people who've had opportunity, who've had different pathways. And because of historical challenges, because of where, they're, where they come from, because of you know, whatever life has dealt them, they may be on a very different path. And changing that equation and giving people the access to the right kind of support just reaps enormous benefits. And it, you know, and, and it not only benefits them, it benefits their family, it benefits our communities, it benefits our entire country. And I just, you know, in, in, in this, I guess this conviction I've had for the need of, of, of adults who need a different way in life was just, you know, affirmed many times over working at HUD and working at the SBA because I had access to so many people in difficulty and saw their circumstances. And it just, um, so when I got on the, 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 the Goodwill website and started, you know, looking at people and their stories, like I just thought of people I knew and I thought of people in my family and I thought of people that, you know, I, I, I'd met when I was at the SBA or at HUD. And um, it just, you know, it just, it, it just felt like it was a part of me. So we, um, you know, we, we uh, it's an incredible network. Goodwill uh, has 100 and 20,000 employees, uh, and many of those people are part of our mission where they get skills training and support to start out and grow in their careers. Over a million come to our workforce centers every year. Those are not in the stores, they're dedicated centers, and those people get um, support finding a job. They get training in areas like digital or manufacturing training. And then we get 20 million people online. And, um, and, and, and the stories of the people we serve are just, um, you know, they're just, uh, you know, remarkable stories of success and change lives. And uh, it's just thrilling. It's just thrilling to be a part of it. Goodwill does great work. And you've talked a little bit about the scope of the organization before going more into that and how Goodwill has also reinvented itself. I'm curious, before even Goodwill, it seems like you had a very specific target in mind in the mission statement that you had written with respect to those opportunities that you had seen both growing up. But was there anything that you saw in your life at that moment that made that a big part of what you wanted your mission to be? Then mm -hmm. finding out about Goodwill and seeing that Goodwill serves exactly that mission. Right. When I was um, a single guy in New York City. Um, I spent every Saturday uh, in uh, working with kids. And for a period of time, I was spending a lot of time uh, in the Was Washington Heights neighborhood, working uh, within uh, the Dominican community, both in Washington Heights and in the South Bronx. And uh, it was just a uh, sobering bird's eye view of what children are faced and how they develop because of 
what they face. And during that time, I actually took a young man in to live with me who'd been, uh, you know, kicked out of his house. He didn't have a father, didn't have anywhere to go. And um, I just said, come and live with me. Interestingly, I was engaged at the time. So I had a chaperone, <laughs> some 16 year old <laughs> chaperone. And in the process of his, you know, living with me, I, it, it just gave me a, a, a much deeper understanding of how his wiring had been formed and why and what it meant for him to negotiate life every day as a, as a teenager in the inner city. Well, fast forward many years, uh, I was spending much of my volunteer and philanthropic energies working with adults uh, in Chicago through uh, various uh, training and development programs or other programs that help people in great difficulty. And I felt like I could see what his life would have been had he not gotten the support he needed to get out. And I could see why people had made the decisions they made and why they had made the mistakes they made based on where they had come from and the circumstances that they lived in. And it just, uh, it, it sort of, you know, more deeply ingrained in me the deep conviction that every person is an opportunity. Every person has a pathway that can be great, but so many people don't have access. And I just felt very compelled to be part of the solution for people to get back on the right track. And I, I, and I, I, I think it's so important when I say that to understand that when people go through that process, it's them doing the work, them investing in themselves, them making the tough decisions to, to move forward and make the sacrifices. Um, but it's so critical to give people access to the tools and supports they need to be able to make that investment so they can equip themselves uh, for, you know, for a different kind of future. It really is, Steve. And I wonder what it takes to do that. Back to the mid-1990s in the greater Washington, D.C. region, as AOL was growing, uh, there was the Potomac Conference, pulled together a lot of senior leaders from the region, sponsored by America Online, talking about the opportunity gap. And there are people in parts of the community that need jobs. There are parts of community that need employees. And they were talking about busing people from one place to another and uh, training them and giving them those opportunities. However, fast forward 20 plus years, the gaps are bigger than they were back then. Yeah. So what does it take and what will it take for this to truly be giving people on ramps to the opportunities rather than conversation that at least in my business life has been an ongoing conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there are many things I, I think that we need to do. One of which is to, to help young people uh, acquire marketable skills when they enter the job market. I think too many people don't have them at an early age, but when you think about what we do and we work, we work with people of all age groups, but we work a lot with people who are, you know, you know, later 20s, 30s, even 40s and 50s. It is very difficult for people to get access to the support that they need to move to a different place in life. But the irony is we have 10 or 11 unfilled jobs, a million unfilled jobs right now, and many more people who are unemployed, underemployed, employed and can't pay their bills. And that everybody is projecting that gap to widen because the jobs that are being created require higher skills. The existing jobs, the skill requirements are going up. We need to give people the support that they need <laughs> to get the skills they need so they can compete in the job market tomorrow. And if I am a mom sitting at home with a couple of kids, I can't go to class if I don't have childcare. I may not be able to go to class if I can't get transportation. I may have other impediments in my life. Now, those sound like those are those are you know those are big impediments. The value <laughs> to everybody of helping that person get through those impediments and get those basic skills to be able to get a good, well-paying job to, 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 to support her family is enormous. It far exceeds any cost that it would take to help that person. But it's difficult to find the difficult to find the services. It's difficult to get the, the totality of supports. And um, we need employers to really pay ball, play ball. We need them to think differently about people they hire. 
uh, too many people get knocked out early in the process because they've had a difficult background uh, or because they haven't been in the job market for a while. And um, I tell employers, your next great hire may be somebody you never expected. Uh, think harder, open up your aperture a little bit more. Think about the possible, think about what it would like be like for you to bring different people into your employee base and develop a richer community with people with different experiences. Wow, how great would that be? And I'll tell you, most surveys show, you know, when you talk, let's just use one population, people who've, who've been incarcerated, you know, most surveys show that uh, HR professionals would say there is no difference in performance. And many companies would say performance is better because they're people who are thankful to have a job, they're committed to their employers, and, and they, they, they hunger for a different path forward. So it's a lot, but we have to help people bridge the gap be able to compete for those jobs. And bridging the gap is not an online class. It is helping them move through their lives to get to that other point. And when they get to that other point, we need employers to open up the doors and say, yes, you are qualified. I do want you to be part of my team and I do want to be part of your future. And that's what it takes. A couple of uh, points with respect to what you said, Steve. I just had a conversation with Gina Schaefer and uh, she co-owns, uh, uh, and now they are employee-owned uh, uh, Ace Hardware stores. And her best employees for dozen plus years have been returning citizens. So mm. uh, she has great examples of that. But one of the organizations that uh, uh, I work with, the CEO was saying things similar to what you're saying. And I had to point out to him that the uh, young lady that sits typically at the building's entrance reception, mm -hmm. uh, along with the security guard, has a college degree because they require college degrees for all roles, including the young lady sitting at the front desk. So meaning the, the conversation, <laughs> the conversation is there. And the CEO was very much advocating for a lot of these things, but wasn't aware that in their own organization, they required standard college degrees on, unless there was an exception requested. It's crazy. It's we, we've, we've, we've attributed uh, values to a college degree that are far beyond what a great college degree, you know, uh, provides. And the other thing is we have cut out millions of people that should be eligible for jobs, many of whom are people of color, uh, people with lower income and people from difficult backgrounds. Uh, uh, and so, and uh, many studies have shown that people without college degrees can acquire those same skills through various career pathways. And um, last year, the business roundtable, you know, very large business organization, all the largest business in the country, 80 some members of the BRT came forward and said, we are going to rewrite our job descriptions. We are going to get out there and we're going to look at this differently because we need to be able to open up opportunity to more people that are qualified. And I will tell you, a number of years ago, I was running a company and I needed a new head of HR. And it was, you know, it was a good sized company. And I was hiring and I was working with an executive recruiter and they were putting all these people in front of me. And they said, like, I want you to interview one person, but you don't have to talk to her because she, she never finished college. And I, I said, well, send her over. I'll talk to her. And I hired her. She competed against all these people that had been at other companies and had in fancy degrees. And she, she didn't have a college degree and she was street smart. She had worked, um, she always was seeking to understand better, always seeking to improve herself, um, always seeking to show up in the right way. And we had a frontline employee base, where people who picked up phones and entered data and you know had very kind of entry level jobs. And those were the people she needed to represent as an HR professional. So she had a much better comprehension of the workforce than a lot of other people would have had. And, um, She's one of the best HR professionals I've ever worked with. And I was, I was, you know, thankful that they didn't take her off the list uh, because she was such a talent. So now, Steve, as the president and CEO of uh, Goodwill Industries, what are you and what is Goodwill doing 
to help bridge those divides and give access to the opportunities. Yes. Well, that's what we're all about. That is our mission. Our mission is to help people uh, reach their full potential through learning and the power of work. So we do it through a number of ways. We do it, you know, primarily supporting people who come through the door and say, I need a job or I need a better job and I need help to get there. So in some cases, people are job ready and we will provide them support writing their resume and understanding what their skills um, would, would uh, qualify them for and giving them comprehension of the local job market and giving them interview skills and say, let's make sure you're targeting the right thing, that you're ready to go in there strong and that you can succeed. In other cases, we provide much more comprehensive services. So for example, we have a program for uh, uh, returning citizens that is a uh, six to 12 month program where we do everything from a very detailed assessment of their lives, what they need in terms of training and personal support, then we make sure they get it, provide them with a career coach all along the way, the training, everything they need. And then when they're ready for that job, we work with them to find the job and, and land the job that they aspire to get. And many times during that process, they may work in our stores to earn a living, or they may work somewhere else that, to bridge them, but it's a very comprehensive long-term program. And then sort of all points in between, we have digital skills program, you know, uh, manufacturing skills programs, but I'll never forget. There's a, a, a woman who uh, came through our digital skills program and we did a video on her and she starts out the program saying, you know, where I grew up, people didn't talk about career paths. Uh, and a year ago I was homeless and I had two daughters. And I was just telling them it was temporary. It was kind of like a vacation, not knowing what I was going to do or where I was going to go. And then she said, I came to Goodwill and she entered our digital skills program. She said she joined the 4 a.m. club and had, we had a little video of her doing her homework like early <laughs> in the morning with the lights all you know, dark. And then it take, we kind of took her through the pathway. And then at the end, she lands a really good job. And she gets a house. And she said, my kids were saying, mom, we got a house. We got, we got a job. And she said, I've come this far. I'm heading for the stars. Now, she starts up by saying, a year ago, I was homeless. And I didn't know where I was going to go. And today, she's saying, I'm heading for the stars. So it wasn't just about what happened financially and for her family, which is terrific. Her whole understanding of what life was about and what the possibilities are was fundamentally changed. And it was one person and she, and it was because she said, where I grew up, nobody talked about this stuff. I didn't have access to it. I didn't have role models. I didn't have, I didn't know where to go, but I came to Goodwill and that's, that's what got me started. And it does take a system and, as you said, a support structure around that individual to give them the opportunity to access and be able to elevate themselves. Now, that's a lot of great things that Goodwill is doing with respect to what business leaders should be thinking about, in addition to you mentioning taking down some of the traditional barriers that have been used, including the need for college degrees to get the simplest jobs in the organization. What else can business leaders do to make sure that we continue bridging these divides in action rather than just in words? Well, yeah. So uh, I think it's very important for employers to provide training and development opportunities for their ex existing employees, and especially those sort of at the, you know, uh, on the front line and sort of at that entry level. The world is changing quickly, jobs everywhere are changing quickly, and employers really need to bear the burden of lifting the, uh, the skill level of their employee base so that they can meet the, the demands. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think it's important for employers, you know, if they've got the capacity, not every small business can do this, but if they've got the capacity to provide educational dollars for their people and help them reach their aspirations, I think businesses need to be vocal advocates and hold each other accountable. We do have a number of national companies that have been terrific thought leaders. Uh, and uh, in, in um, providing people with educational opportunities and support. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and I really do think it's, 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 it's changing things. The other thing though, is I do think 
uh, business leaders have to be part of the policy partnership to say, this is where our economy is going. This is where our world is going. And these are the opportunities for our labor force. And there is a fundamental gap. <laughs> There's a fundamental gap between where we're going and the way that people are being skilled. And we need to have programs and capabilities to help people move into those. And you know, it's not just I mean, we're talking about the individuals and their families because that's where our hearts are and what drives us. But this is about having a competitive labor force. This is about being able to compete in a global economy. And it is also about having a society that doesn't continue to pull apart. I mean, the reason we pulled apart so much is because we have haves and have nots to a degree that we've never had before. And people don't see hope and opportunity. And we need, we need an educational system. We need the, the kinds of government supports that give people the opportunity to invest in themselves for a different future. And I think corporations can be, you know, they, they, they've got access, they've got power, and they know what they need and where the world is going. And they can be very effective forces for good on the macro level. And we need them to do that. And that's where I would love to get some of your thoughts, Steve, with respect to where the world is going. There's a lot of talk about the future of work and a lot of talk about the fact that many of the opportunities and roles that are available are requiring higher and higher levels of not necessarily education, but the skills that are uh, that require intense study. So when mm -hmm. you think about certain level of coding, it requires yeah. people with a certain skill set. So the fact that there are lots of coding jobs available doesn't necessarily mean people can be reskilled to fit those roles. So where do you see the future of work going? And again, how can we bridge divides for all in our community rather than a subset of the group? Right, so when you look at the future of work trends, all the indications are that lower skilled jobs are going away and higher skilled jobs are being created. So the good news is we're not saying net jobs are going away. Jobs are being created. Uh, to your point, they are heavily in technology in many cases. Many of them are uh, in healthcare. And also many of them are in sort of the social and cognitive skills that would support product development in a changing world. But I, I'd say a few things. Number one, if you look at the, the decade, after the Great Recession, two thirds of the new jobs created required medium or higher level digital skills. That's not coding, that's basic digital skills. So even if people are moving up into those better jobs from existing jobs, the base jobs just need digital skills and some fundamentals, that's the price of entry. So we need, we need to get people at that baseline. What we have found is that when people get a base level of proficiency or a certain level of proficiency, they're more likely to move into coding once they're comfortable with it, or they're more likely to move into something more technical once they get the confidence that they can um, understand those skills and acquire them and move into those places. So I, 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 wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say that we just have to focus on those higher skills because the core skills are what are, are, are cutting people out of a lot of opportunity. Once again, I think a robust community college network, if it's done well, can be really powerful to help people move into those basic skills. I think workforce development supply, uh, providers like us, if we can get the funding and support to do it, can provide great uh, support. And people will come to us that won't go to a college because we're goodwill and we're sort of, you know, we're a little bit like a warm blanket. They trust us. It doesn't feel too schooly. They'll come to us for support. But it's, 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 it's those access points. It's those access points where we can get people to come in, we can get them in a class, and we can give them the supports they need. That requires funding. It does. And we're talking a lot about funding in the government right now. But when you look at labor as our most strategic asset, and I think the opportunity gap is one of our most critical risks in our country. Um, this is a place where we need to invest in as a country. And the dividends are enormous financially and in terms of transformed lives. But we need to be able to, 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 to provide funding for and support for people who need that support in their communities for relevant jobs in their communities. 
couldn't agree with you more, Steve, that that opportunity gap can be bridged. However, uh, I have a conversation with Azim Azhar. He's done a lot of research and talks about the exponential technologies and their impact on our society. If we don't bridge the gap, the divides are going to become bigger and have significant negative consequences on our entire society. So it is Absolutely. important for all of us as leaders in the community, business leaders to bridge those gaps. It's the right thing to do for the people in the society and our communities, but it's also the right thing to do for the organizations themselves in the long term. Now, uh, I would also love to know you have uh, led uh, in private sector, in government, now uh, a nonprofit, uh, very capably. Are there any leadership resources or practices you find yourself typically recommending for leaders as they want to improve their own leadership? Oh, my goodness. Um... I am not a big reader of business books, but I'm a good I'm a good page turner. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I I think that um, what I would say is I, I don't know that I you know I I love Peter Drucker, I love uh, Jim Collins, you know I, I I love anything that talks about change management because there's so much depth in there, uh, you know. I know and have worked with Daryl Connor, uh, but what I would say to you is, um, when when you're looking at being an organizational leader, and I've learned as much or more from my mistakes, and I continue to make mistakes as I have from my successes, and I think it's one of the important things about having these discussions is everybody kind of looks nice and packaged when you talk about your past, but uh, you know there's been a lot of uh, you know stubbed toes and broken glass along the way. I think if I were recommending to anybody to think about what it means to be authentic as a leader for the people that you lead and understanding what it takes for them to be to bring forward their best every day in terms of ideas, creativity, productivity, giving them the support they need, giving them the structures they need, potentially giving them the capital they need, holding them to a level of accountability and rigor and then sponsoring them through that change. And for me, that's been one of the most important lessons I have learned is you don't do anything yourself. You do everything through your people. And if you can't, if you can't inspire them and provide them a vision, in many cases, it's helping them provide you with a vision and lead them along the way, um, you are significantly, um, you're missing a significant opportunity for growth and for, for impact. What beautiful sentiments, Steve, on the authenticity it takes to truly unleash the potential of the people in your team and in the organization. And I am so excited that uh, with all of your background and experience, you have continually married it with purpose. And at this point, have married it with a purpose that uh, I truly believe is something we as a community and society need to tackle. This opportunity gap uh, is something that is a, a negative impact on so many people in our communities, and it's going to get worse unless we think about it from a policy perspective, we think about it as business leaders, and have nonprofit leaders like you having the right conversations and providing the opportunities and the wraparound services it takes to help elevate people. So I truly appreciate your leadership and the conversation for the Partnering Leadership Podcast. Thank you so much, Steve Preston. Thank you for having me.